and we're a new youth-led organisation based in um, County Durham and this is part of our launch so we launched on Monday we opened for business and we've had a really lovely week and lots of really interesting conversations on our webinars so we're really looking forward to more of the same this morning. Um, this morning we're talking about peer training and I really wanted to, to do a um, to have a discussion around peer training because I think it's one of um, one of the lived experience rules that's really kind of misunderstood around it being like a really again being a really skilled role and often people think of peer trainers as people who bring their lived experience um, to training through stories but I think it, there's a lot more to it than that so one of the things we'll be talking about this morning is kind of some of the unique styles that come from peer training around how people facilitate what they bring to the train and the different ways that we might approach training and that kind of thing. So, um, so just to get us started, um, I'll introduce you to the speaker. So I'm gonna start with Tyne. Tyne, if you'd like to just introduce yourself um, and a little bit about what you do. Hi, I'm Tyne and I'm a peer supporter within CNTW Trust. Um, I've been a peer supporter now for five years. I started on inpatient and female acute in Sunderland um, and I worked there for three years and then I um, went to perinatal community treatment team for two years and I'm currently on secondment in Cumbria as a senior peer supporter mentoring and um, their first step of peer supporters there's um there's eight of them at the moment um, so that's their first step of ones, which was really exciting. So um, that's I started that last month and I'm there for six months. Lovely. Thanks, Tyne. And Fran, if you want to um, introduce yourself, you're a colleague of Tyne's and just tell us a bit about you and, and your work. Yep. I'm just working on how to unmute. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> my name's Fran. Um, I also work in um, CNTW Trust um, with Tyne, um, so I was a peer supporter, um, I worked on an acute children and young people's ward, um, and then our trust is developing the pathway and the kind of structure of support around peer supporters, um, so they introduced four roles for each locality because the trust is really big um, to as, as facilitators so my title is development and well-being facilitator which is a bit vague um, but really it's um, it's a, it's for peer support within the north um, so Northumberland is where so we have um, ooh, over getting up to 50 peer supporters now in the trust and that's growing and we're doing recruitments all the time so that's kind of what I've moved into the recruitment the support um pastoral support and kind of development which includes training um, and facilitating as well thanks Fran you know I'm really chuffed that we're all from the like from a, like a really small section of the north like Lisa, who's going to, I'm going to ask you to just introduce herself next. She's just over the border in, in Scotland. So we've got like Durham, like um, I think you're on Northumberland Way, aren't you, Fran? Tyne, you're over in Cumbria. And then we've got Lisa on the border. Um, so do you want to introduce yourself, um, Lisa, and, and what, what you do? So I'm Lisa. Um, as Becky says, I'm in the Scottish border. So just just hop over the border there and you'll find me. Um, I'm in Gala Shields. I've just moved back to the borders. I actually grew up here, I'm from here, but um, kind of left when I was 16 and went on a bit of an adventure. And the past seven years I've been living in New Zealand, um, just came back in July, thanks COVID, and <laughs> regrounded myself in my Scottish roots again, which is actually quite lovely, I have to say. So I first started to work in peer support in, whew, 1999, a little while ago, um, after I was a student and had some fairly epic meltdown moments over clawing my way through a degree and um, started to access mental health services, encountered some clinicians who I found fairly unhelpful at the time, and then came across this little peer support group in the university. And um, when I graduated, ironically, with a degree in psychology, um, ended up running the peer support group, moving into peer support, and I never worked in clinical roles since. So um, 
ran peer support groups and then just was in peer roles for probably about 10 years and then went into management and setting up services and training and so yes yeah, since probably for about the past 10 years I've been a trainer and um, my main job is I work for intentional peer support which is a kind of peer training provider in America that was set up actually it came from the psychiatric survivor movement and we do training all over the world really so I was running the New Zealand hub and um, just come back and I'm just doing bits and bobs of training here and there. And yeah, that's me. Thanks, Lisa. And yeah, so I guess like I wanted to, I wanted to start with you, Lisa, if I can, with like just to start talking around some of the questions and stuff that I've I've got for us today, because one of the things that I think is really important is talking about the way that training's developed in like the style of training and how how we approach it differently from in peer support and the way that um that, that it's about collective stories for us rather than necessarily just bringing out our, our own and how we share and learn together. So I just wanted to give you a bit of a chance to talk around, specifically, I guess, around around IPS, the IPS training and, and how that's different to like a traditional um, knowledge-based learning course. Yeah, and I think for me, it kind of, I mean, I probably intentionally don't call myself a trainer. I call myself a facilitator. And there's a there's a point for me around actually, I think my role is to facilitate a space within which we really draw out these discussions that need to be had, rather than thinking it's my job as a trainer to impart my knowledge all the time. It's actually, how do we create a space in which we can all learn together? Because through that we grow and we do that through, yeah, in part sharing our stories, but also through actually, what are some of the adverse situations we have to overcome? What's some of the marginalization and oppression that goes on? Where are some of the privileges that we carry? And when we start to have conversations about that, um, and even just around how do we stay connected when one of us is having a hard time? You know, it could be either of us. You know, people have different languages and ways of expressing their pain that can be really unhelpful for the other people around them. And I think for me, intentional peer support or any peer support training that has an intentionality that is around actually mutual learning, and creating and holding space. I think that's a shift that's much different from just training or just, you know, this is my story, this is my knowledge and here have a spoonful of it. Instead, you're trying to draw something out of all of the participants so that you're creating something new together. So I think about, gosh, I must've done, I don't I can't even count now, but for seven years, I've been doing pretty much back-to-back -back IPS trainings. And every single one has been different because it's not a format that's just set. Like there's a obviously a, a format in terms of, well, these are the topics we're gonna discuss and this is the, the flow. But what you get from each and every group is different because it comes from the participants. So I love this way of um, working and it, it's something that I've found has just felt really meaningful. And I think that's what's, for me, ended up feeling like it's not just a job. It's actually, we are creating social change with every single, um, space that we go into and shifting conversations and challenging people to see things differently. And I think there's something really important around the peer training as well to enable that to happen and being able to be vulnerable ourselves and then invite invite vulnerability into, the, into the, the space. And I know you've done a lot of training, Lisa, with um, with like not with pe people who wouldn't consider themselves to be peers, so like in service and stuff like that. But I want to bounce this to to time. Um, because obviously you're working in statutory services, time working for an NHS trust. And I think that that's an unusual way of, of bringing something to training is to be a vulnerable trainer and try and flatten the hierarchy in the training so that you can have meaningful conversations about experience. And I just wanted to think about how you've approached bringing that to like an NHS trust. Like how do you find trying to get the balance between what they expect and what you want them to bring to the room? Yeah, I think, um... You know, I think you're right in what you've just said in terms of bringing that vulnerability. Um, we do, and I think we do it in a lot of the work we do, not just in the training. We do, we do bring that side, um, and you know, we become, um, you know, equipped. We are resilient people as peers. I do feel like we do have that resilience, and we we built that up. Um, I I spent a lot of time 
getting into my role of peer support before I went into training and so I felt like I was able to get that experience first I didn't throw myself straight into things like that because I'd never done training before ever um but it did seem like it would be a natural thing to progress into as soon as I started in the role um but I gave myself that time first to really um develop myself in terms of being getting used to that exposure of vulnerability um within the role and then bring that into training I do feel like you know having that time to to do that um I brought it into training because I think when you're working within your clinical role you working with the same people and you kind of get used to that but when you're training you don't know who's going to be there you don't know who's going to be in the room um so yeah it is it is a negotiation and a balance of trying to get that right but I suppose you know you, you prepare yourself really you feel like you're going to be prepared to um share those things and and possibly open yourself up to questions that you're not really expecting as well so they can throw up a little bit of a um curveball um but yeah again I, th- I just think out of experience I was able to you know get used to having those questions and bringing those in and um you know knowing how to um really you know feel for people to feel comfortable about ask questions because I think sometimes um people are a bit nervous to kind of go in um you know with with questions that you think might upset me or, or stuff like that and I think with training being able to start off given that experience it kind of um makes people feel a bit more comfortable so it's a bit of an icebreaker really just sharing some of that experience but as you say it's not the the training as a whole isn't around a peer sharing experience but I do think it helps to start with because it it makes people feel comfortable to ask questions later on in the training yeah and I think so much of what we what we do in, in a lot of the training that comes particularly around mental health stuff like a lot of the training people get is really quite kind of policy theory based and a lot of and but but we're engaging in human relationships all of the time and we're both having experiences even if it's not a peer relationship and it's not that reciprocal kind of relationship like we're both experiencing that relationship so I think it's helpful in in when we're working in in public service roles where we're working with humans that like we're aware of the fact that we're bringing something as well yeah Fran because you're working in, in like a development role and you're thinking about support and peer roles like I guess I'm wondering like what kind of things have you been thinking about in terms of the development people who were who were training I remember really naively going into my first training in a peer role in the NHS and just thinking I could fly by the seat of my pants like I could do in a presentation about like I don't know business planning and then getting really caught off guard by the by by questions that were quite personal, even though I've just talked about my personal story. So I guess like in a development role, part of what you would do would be preparing peers for for training and supporting them through supervision and stuff. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think um, because peer work is quite new or is quite, a role that is is can be misunderstood or isn't there there isn't a lot of um definition around the role it's it's a, it's about it's it's about um helping people to feel that they can really fly the flag but do it how they want to do it so if for example somebody wants to get involved in training then we've got new senior peer supporters who've maybe been doing that for a while who would work with them but all any sort of presentations because a lot we've got our own involvement service now and so um a lot of the time peers are asked through that or even just through the connections that they've they've made in the in the trust to get involved in training um which is great but for, for me it's it's about coming into that training so for example we might get a, um, a request saying oh could you help deliver this formulation training these are the dates um you know um it would be great to have a peer involved and um i'll get back and say okay so but will they be able to look at the training 
beforehand will they be able to talk to you will they be able to you know contribute to that training or you know help design that training and all of them stuff so that you enter it on a level field because just because somebody has that experience of maybe doing a formulation with somebody in a psychologist role the a PM might have experience of having a formulation done to them so that's that's given equal weight into both sides and so I suppose it's about supporting somebody to feel confident enough to 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 kind of ask for that not ask for that but just just say that you know it, it is important for me to come into this as an equal um the amount of times where I've went in um and just kind of thought regardless of banding you are a human being I am a human being and we've both got you know experience to bring and probably being quite bullshit and probably being quite you know just like okay that's fine let's do this training together and that that's maybe taken somebody aback or something but actually when we've started working together we found similar experiences different views and we're able to the find the final product before you even do the training um that way it's it's about getting away from tokenism and i think if people can feel that power within them to actually go no i'm not going to be a token um then that training that comes will always be so much you know more more educational but it's more rich, real you know, it's in, in, it's richer in terms of like like i was just, like just be saying that there's, there's two there's two people bringing something to every relationship in a service at least two people bringing stuff into that and it is quite kind of there's already enough power in that dynamic between clinician and service user without then adding the power of um, the training that that clinician receives not having the perspective of people who've been in the service you so that it, I guess the less that we're involved in the training the less that power that power relationship can be more equal um, and I just want I guess one of the things that comes to my mind when I think about the nervousness around it being anything more than tokenistic is that is that is the stigma around the really difficult stuff that might come up in training and whether or not peers can handle it and I know that there's kind of this kind of I've felt it in myself, myself in the room where something's come up that feels really difficult and there's almost been like a, oh my god is Vicky going to be all right because she's a bit mad and this might set her off and I know that sounds like but I, I have felt that tension of like there's, there's a safety issue coming up and I think time I, I think you've mentioned just just now that you've been doing some training around like aces and trauma and that kind of stuff and it is quite motivated like quite a quite emotive subjects and I just it thought like, if you can talk around how you how you approach that to make it like um boundaries and about learning but then also not to escape not to try and run away from those more difficult conversations where actually there's a whole load of value in talking about that tough stuff yeah there really is and um you know that the ACEs training that I currently do is part of the formulation training so there's many peers who co-facilitate that formulation training you know, I guess from our own experiences, we all do different parts. So we do it with it with another trainer who might do more of the, the clinical stuff and then a peer can choose which parts. Um, and because of my experience working in perinatal, um, which if you if for people who might not know, it's um from um for ladies who are pregnant up to one year postnatal. Um and th- the bread and butter of everything we do within that is around bond and attachment with baby and adverse childhood experiences, just trying to break that cycle um, of intergenerational problems um, that happen. Um, so when I do formulation training, that kind of seems to be the thing that um, I talk about it all of the time. Like it, uh, everything I do, <laughs> I, talk, I bring adverse childhood experience in. I could talk about it all day. Um, but so I, I do a lot of that talking about that in the formulation training because of um, the things that, you know, I've, the, the kind of services that I've worked with. Um, but I think if there is, if I am kind of feeling that vulnerability and if it is something that's quite challenging, I can also take myself out of my own experiences and use the experiences of other people that I've worked with. Um, so it kind of feels like it, it 
you know, there's that emotional disconnection of something that's kind of feeling a bit raw for me and um, because we don't, as peers, I don't think we should just, you know, share our own experiences. We've worked with so many people who've been through so many difficult things that I think we should learn from that as well. Um, so, you know, often it's about kind of thinking about, actually, I know somebody who kind of went through that experience and I can draw on what they told me about that experience and share that obviously not sharing that that person's details of anything but as if I can kind of share that just that experience and how that person overcome that um so I, I do feel like in, yeah we, we do we have worked with such a varied um you know amount of people that why can't we share other people's experiences as well and you know because we're always learning and I, don't, I think that where, that's where it comes from being about an individual person's stories to be in that kind of collective advocacy and really advocating for, for everybody to have a role in their own, whether it's having a role in their own care or being able to kind of not see everybody as like a homogenous mental health service user, that, that, there's, that that's where we step into that. And I think as well, one of the things, so like thinking about those difficult experiences and thinking of that as being a way of like, of being able to separate your own personal stuff from what you're delivering and making it more collective. Yeah. Um, when I was doing the, the um, intentional piece of court training and Lisa trained me both times, she trained me on my court training and she trained me on my train the trainer training. I'm not sure whether or not she regrets it, but happens to happen. <laughs> um, one of the things that I really loved about that training was just like right from the start, there was this kind of like, we're not gonna treat you as fragile. Like we're gonna have, we're gonna agree what we're gonna do when things get difficult, and we're just gonna like we're not gonna assume that that just because we're talking about difficult stuff, people aren't gonna be able to manage. Yeah. And I, so I thought maybe it's Lisa, like the way that that's facilitated is so kind of like it's facilitated in a very human way, but actually for people that can be quite a like a, a shock to have that kind of like when we're not gonna come running out of a room after you if you feel like you need five minutes was like all right, okay, so I'm gonna be treated like a, an adult then. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit around that kind of where that came from. Yeah, and I think it probably comes from like people going into training thinking it's going to be comfortable, right? And all these assumptions, oh, this is going to be a nice training space. It'll be all pleasant. I'll sit there and listen to a person teach. I mean, I won't have to contribute anything myself, particularly anything that makes me feel uncomfortable. So the first thing we do when we start an IPS training is actually talk, create what's called a discomfort agreement is to say, you're going to feel uncomfortable at times because we're going to be talking about some of the hard stuff. So what can we create in this space together that makes it feel possible to do that? Because we want to, we learn most when we're stretched and when we feel uncomfortable, like that's the learning space. And when we feel comfortable, we're not really pushed and challenged, particularly around some of the assumptions that we carry. Like, because... It's I was listening to what you were saying, Tyne, and it, you know, sometimes this assumption that there's a service user story and it's like this one generic rollout, a service user, and they'll tell you the same thing. It doesn't really matter. And it does because like one of the things around the worldview stuff is like every single person's story of navigating the service is unique because of their race, their culture, their gender, their upbringing, their socioeconomic status and everything else in between is there isn't just so I think it is important you know you're saying around bringing in other people's stories and and challenging around well what difference would it make if I was black what difference would it make if I was young what difference would it make if I was you know and actually starting to think about other perspectives not just our own because otherwise we can really get into that space of it just coming from one perspective or one lens and the discomfort agreement really holds space that we can keep coming back to it and we can keep saying, okay, you know, we felt like the energy got a little bit heavy. Is there something we need to do differently? Like, what do we need to do in this space? And it's not about, you know, if you need to run out the room, put your hand up and I'll chase you. Because actually, where's the learning in that? You know, what do I need to do to keep you in the room so that you can actually feel like you're upset or you're angry? And we can hold space for you to have that big feeling because that's when we're all processing it and learning. And I won't learn about some of the assumptions I've got, unless I can see another person in discomfort and we can work it through together. So it really encourages that relational way of doing things, even within a learning community is you're not there to be comfortable. You're not there for me to just 
give you a spoonful of education. You're here to feel challenged and to grow. And then when you leave the room, you're hopefully going to do things a little bit differently. And in fact, we all will as a result of this experience collectively. And I think, and I think what's, I think it's really interesting that we use those kinds of like the IPS. So IPS has developed that agreement for their training, and there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that, that that training for some people is going to be quite difficult or, or unusual or different in, in the style that it's taken. But I think that there's a lot of the time that in mental health services, when I deliver training to staff, which is one of the things that I used to do, <laughs> that actually that that it, some of the stuff that we're talking about is quite difficult for staff, especially when we're talking about iatrogenic harm. And especially when we're talking about when things haven't worked um, and that one of the things I found really helpful is using, is pinching a bit of that discomfort agreement and using it with staff so that when we get into that kind of actually when we, when we have these interactions with services, it does, it can be hurt. It's not just that it doesn't work, it's that it can be harmful. Like for staff being able to express themselves and being able to think about, well, you know, I'm being challenged now and what makes me feel able to, to talk about my stuff as a staff member and how that impacts on me because if we can't do that like you said that's the part where we learn that's the part where we grow if we shut that part of us down in a training that's the end of the learning experience and I guess Fran one of the things that I was thinking about with um with the work that you guys do is that you um CNTW has been on a journey with peer support and there's a developing and he's a moving forward now and a lot of that interaction is going to come with um with with non peer staff, with clinical staff, or with corporate staff, mm -hmm. with admin staff, or you know whoever, um, and and how are you thinking about things like team preparation and um, those kinds of, in inverted commas, like trainings, but that really need people to be in the room talking about the hard stuff. So when when you say team preparation, is that team preparation for a peer supporter to go into that team? Yeah, or just like yeah. if you're talking to people who've had got, a, if you if you're working with people who are wanting to work with peers and um, they've got a very a very embedded way of doing things, it's quite different. It how do you know, how are you how are you kind of approaching being able to open that up to new? Yeah, new it's, it's, it it is something that I think a lot you know it is worth having a a, a lot of thought into it and you know learning from past experiences of because we've had peers for about 10 years coming up 10 years now and some of the early experiences of people were extremely difficult um going into teams it's about listening to those people and their those experiences and i think at the moment we've got a good thing going so it's um it's something that time's been heavily involved in developing when it comes to Cumbria and we're learning all the time. So we used to think that um, you've got a team, you've got somebody within the team, usually a manager. It could have come from director level saying you need to get up here. Well, nobody, you know, change is difficult um, and nobody likes change to be inflicted on you. It, it, it's about choice. So we try and recognise that and respect that. Um, there's usually some allies within a team who might have been, you know, interested in peer support or, you know, and, and they help from inside um, spreading the word and kind of challenging those assumptions. But we also have invite everybody to team preparation um, presentations and talks. What we've tried to do is facilitate some of those difficult discussions about assumptions and say, look, this is the space, this is the time that your, your peer supporter hasn't come into your team yet. Um, but we here are some experienced peers who are delivering this presentation, which has been co-produced, um, to, to have those. And, and, and we've come to this space willing to be, you know, you don't need to feel like you're going to offend us because, to be honest, we've probably heard it all before. And we've had to talk about it before and a quite a big part of, of it being a peer is to have that dialogue is to facilitate that dialogue and challenge so that's kind of what we've been doing we've been having these team preparation days but i think in over in cumbria what you've done is just by chance haven't been able to do one beforehand of going in and actually it's been the peers went into that team and started their job and then it's afterwards they've done that so they've been able to be part of that presentation and it's the the discussion is so much more 
vibrant, colourful. It, people can put a face to a name. They can put a, you know, a job title to tasks, to ways of doing stuff. And it has been a lot, um, seems more fruitful. Um, yeah, it was. We, we done one yesterday um, with um, the, the old adult community team and there's two peers gone in there. Um, and yeah, the, it went so, it flowed so much better than it would have done beforehand. Because I think it would have been known, isn't it? It's yeah, like... yeah. And it, and it just seems like if when we're doing this team preparation beforehand, it's all around assumptions and, um, you know, what what problems might arise or and things like that. But when you're doing it afterwards, it's talking about it's very much solution focused. So um, the, the peers within that team have started seeing um, carers and service users um, in, in the, the, the um, say, for instance, the nurse, the CPN, um, has said, so we, we're working with this person, but how do you think that would unfold? And how do you think we can continue that work? And we kind of, were, we're really talking about how that's going to um, extend in the future and how peers can network within the community and things like that. So yeah, it went really, really well um, doing it that way. And um, I think we're going to do that a lot more now. We're going to go yeah. back to the teams once the peers have been in a month or two. Yeah, and just say, how's, you know, how's things going? And, you know, have you come up with anything or can you think of any unique ways the peer can um, fit into the team? And yesterday people were coming up with ideas that, oh, actually, I was thinking of this, but I wasn't sure they whether it was... Like the community and that they're part yeah. of and they're not this other thing, alien yeah. coming in. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> really yeah. as well in around around this, this type of... Um, of training and in that like we have as peers we're going into teams and we're challenging people and that doesn't work if they don't feel able to challenge us back and I, I like the idea of kind of having those relationships before you start that kind of like looking at opportunities but also mm -hmm. looking at challenges and and being able to, to to build relationships because of the fact that like it is difficult I mean when we when we did our team prep before we brought peers in when I was in in two um a lot of the conversations were around that like well how do we know like how to how to challenge stuff because like we don't like we were talking about the peers coming in as being about part of their role is going to be changed and and because well, because they hadn't met the, the people who were coming in the team it was kind of like well what, well what does that mean and how are we going to do that and um, uh, do you not think sorry Vicky I'm interrupting it's all right go on do you not think it's just absolutely, it just shows you, you you're asking somebody to be this change agent, this, you know, this dynamic social change I think agent. That's one of the things around, around peer work is it's so values based, like we're so trying to f figure this stuff out and to go like take ourselves on this journey where the end result is that is that social change stuff. And that's what intentional peer support was all about, wasn't it, Lisa? Like Sherry set up intentional peer support thinking about change and thinking about doing things differently because what had been experienced before just wasn't working and I think that kind of um what what happens inside the system and the fact that we are still struggling to get peers into roles where their skills and expertise are valued in their paychecks as well as as well as in other things um but bringing it outside again Lisa um, and thinking about the values that we're bringing to communities like um and the, the way that IPS is kind of like I see IPS as being like this is what we offer and like you can come to us and find out about it but you can like like it or leave it and um a very kind of values based like this is this is what it's going to be and um and uh, how that those values are brought to the train in itself as well um through the worldview element I guess as much as anything else of like of what IPS is that respect for worldview and then not everybody's going to get it and not everybody's going to want it just wanted to talk a little bit around like the the values that we bring to training and how we hold our integrity to the peer stuff I think IPS is a really good example of that yeah and I think it's probably because it does sit outside the system um I mean whilst we have trained people in the system <laughs> like the machine um IPS isn't necessarily about systems and services it's actually about creating social change so what we can create space for is how do we talk about some of those frustrations we have about systems and services you know it's not just always about changing them but actually why are they understanding and coming maybe from a place of curiosity about 
Why were they created? What are they there for? What purpose do they serve? You know, they were created in a time and a place. Is that still serving us well? And what could look different? It really Im invites that conversation for what could other possibilities look like? You know, if I'm in this space and I'm navigating this bureaucracy, what could be different? What could I bring to that space? How can, and those real values around, I mean, to me, it's in, so we've got like these core kind of tasks and it's it's about connection. And actually, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, how can we be asking people as a service user or a peer or a lived experience worker to go in and change a system when we haven't even formed a connection with them and understood what their experience is. You know, there has to be a journey, a relational journey where even on in that process where we go, tell me about your experience, I'll tell you about mine. Because we also need to understand the clinician's experience because they're part of this um, system that in order to change it, we need to understand it too. And so there's really that need for mutuality, even within the space that we're trying to create some kind of change within, if that's our role. But also, what do we do outside of it to make sure that people's experiences are just heard and validated? It's not trying to fix it. It's not trying to make it palatable. You know, if, I think sometimes the discomfort can be around people want to have the palatable conversations instead of actually the really, really hard ones about you know, how it actually feels to have your rights taken away from you or how it actually feels to not have a voice. And those values of, you know, multiple truths, I think is a really important one for me is, okay, well, there is the clinical story, there is the biomedical model, and that's just one story. We've also got other stories, the spiritual story, you know, the relational story and everything else. And how do we make sure that there's space for all those multiple truths and voices? And that to me is one of the strongest values that we don't see often within the systems or services because it can often be just one perspective. And I think I think one of the things that I really love the idea of around that multiple stories is that that they may make sense, the story might make sense in itself, but it might not make sense obviously with another story that you hold. So some people may still have that kind of medical understanding or that there's something biological going on here. But they might also Yeah, and it's story. it's like it moves away from that whole, you're right, I'm wrong, or that I have to change your mind. I have to go, no, you can't believe that anymore. This is the right way. Instead yeah. going, oh, okay, that's how you feel and that's what makes sense. Tell, help me understand why you feel that way or why that's your understanding. So it gives space for there being, yeah, multiple truths. And and conflicting ones that mm -hmm. where I might, I can at one time believe two things that are very that seem diametrically opposed and couldn't exist together, but they do because I'm human. Um, and I think that, that that's where it comes back to that, that it's about, it's not about the content, it's about the values and it's about the way we are with each other because the content is always gonna be um, relative and to, to the story. So when, when we're, one of the things I love about the IPS training is that it's all questions and, and it's very rarely a statement. So we might talk about connection, but then, it's not, this is what connection is, it's what does connection mean to you? It's always a question um, and it's always discovery about the room so that people can understand that idea of there being different stories, different perspectives, different experiences, even just within one person. And um, so I've just, I've noticed that there's a question in the, in the chat there around, um, around the content for um, working with team preparation. And I, I mean, I think that that is, again, it's a values based, it's a values based content. And I think that that, um, when we're thinking about team preparation, it's, it's entirely different. I found it's entirely different for every team. And every time that we've tried to set, we might set some guidelines, but basically the conversations are going to be different every time. And I think it's one of the key things about team preparation is making sure that it's rooted in peer, in peer values. And yeah. he is delivering and I think do you want to come in there Fran because I do think that there is something about we've just had to change ours all the time <laughs> it's just like you said it's um each service is so individual um in terms of just so many things and also if it's if it's the case that uh you know it's it's co-developed and it's it's co-delivered that in itself each time with with peers while working then brings in difference and then you always get different conversations so but what I would just say just any sort of like practical things what's really helpful I've found is you know one of the one of the big 
dilemmas and questions in peer support, certainly that we found, is around the definition of the role. What, what do you do? What, what, what are your tasks? People have this view, even though it is such a relational thing, that's too hard, I don't know. It's, it's more about tasks and sometimes just having a bit of a teaching of, around what the role is, what it isn't, um, can be a good place to start because then things can come from that and I'll let Tyne come in because she's had much more experience delivering them. Uh, um, I think sometimes the approach I have, we, we do talk about um, what a peer support doesn't do just as much as what a peer supporter does. Um, 53 peer supporters in our trust and not one of us does the same job. We, we all do something completely different depending on the service itself or um, depending on that person's experience. So I, I could, me and Frank could work together in the same place, but do completely different things. Um, so it's about um, learning from each other, really, what, what every, we kind of, we're all quite close in terms of the peer support community that we have. Um, so we draw on each other's experiences. So when I'm doing team preparation, um, for instance, um, it, it could be for children and young persons service. I would go to Fran and just kind of get a little bit of background yeah. on it first. Um, and I would maybe speak to that team manager or, or somebody within the team and just find out what, what kind of like the general role is with it, to be in that service. And then when I do the preparation, I kind of put it back to the rest of the team and say, you know, is there somewhere within your service that you also feel like there's um, a disconnection or mm -hmm. that there might be something that you, you might you feel might enhance the team as a whole and can peer support fit in that and bring their unique um, experiences to kind of fill that gap as well. So it kind of feels like, the, you know, most teams do have those, most teams do have that sense of, oh, I wish we could do more of this because our service users would really benefit from that, but we might not necessarily have the time to do it. So we kind of go in and, and just get a real feel for what the service is. Um, I do shadowing, so I go and shadow people within that team beforehand so that as a senior peer supporter, I can kind of go in and envisage what peer might be able to do and it, and it might work out completely different once that peer's in the role but we support them um to kind of like go in and not have an agenda and not have a list of duties to do because um it's good to have a role where that that isn't the case because it, it you can you can make it whatever you want it want it to be and um and so, yeah, so we, we do that, not, not only in preparation, doing presentations and training, but it's about going in and being with that team as well. And um, I, I know it's a little bit more difficult at the moment with, with COVID restrictions because a lot of people are working from home, but I make connections within the team and just kind of have those discussions um, in person really about outside you know, do you of the have, training yeah outside of the training and because often it is we're doing training over teams at the minute and you throw the opportunities for questions and kind of everyone turns their camera <laughs> camera off and it's really difficult but if you sat with the team in an office and you're just having a general chat about things I might then go in with like so do you think Pierre could like really pick up this kind of role and do this and it's just so much more natural so um to have a senior peer support uh, go in and be able to do that in preparation for the new peers going in is really helpful I'm just I'm, I'm kind of thinking because as you I'm as you're talking there about being with the teams I'm kind of remembering back to when I was working with with clinical teams in the in in the trust in tube and one of the things that I remember being quite different is language mm -hmm. and and I sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll go into peer spaces and I'm just relieved not to have to like use oh. to use and to explain words like mutuality is yeah. one where like 
in a in a peer peer environment, we've got quite a good idea about what mutuality means, and it it, it moves. It's beyond just having shared experiences and in you know, that much deeper appreciation of mutuality, where you're talking about shared responsibility, where you're talking about sharing power or being aware of power and being able to kind of. And I was thinking about like the we have the the community of peers when we talk to each other. We you, we talk in different ways to how we speak when we're in systems, and it's almost like there's a, there's a shorthand peer language, and then there's the like rest of the world language where we yeah. try to explain what we mean when we say things. And I think that's really evident of this idea of like peer support about community, isn't it? Really, like we're talking about real relationships. We're talking about building kind of communities and being part of communities and having responsibility in our communities and being able to be part of it and I think there's kind of one of the things that I find really interesting about when you bring peer support to a team and when you're training in it is the the different the way that we train we almost get people used to this new language because language is stories are about language 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 allows us to tell stories and it's all intersected and I'm just thinking about so at least, at least one of the things that always makes me laugh is when um is when I see the, um, the, whether it's values or tasks or whatever around peace or whether it's intentional peace support or other things, where the words are used on their own and then people have to interpret what the words mean and how very different it is in a peer training where we're talking about what it means together. And I just want it because we're running out of time and I know, that I, can, I do know another question in the chat and I'll come to that in a second, but I just wanted, when we're talking about these overlaps between clinical systemic worlds and peers and their communities. Like I think language is a really important thing to talk about, but I also want to pull on your experiences of working with different cultures and different groups and their languages, because I think there's a lot of restriction in using English actually, in the way that we talk about community and culture because we're such an individualized culture. So I just wanted to kind of ask you please to talk a little bit about some of the different communities that you've worked with and how they express themselves differently. Yeah, and I think it's a really valid point and it's actually something that can be helpful as the starting point is actually what language do we use and why? And when we're working with any group is making sure we use a language that we collectively agree on. One of the things that, so I've done a lot of work with Māori and Pacifica in um, New Zealand and in surrounding islands. And there is no individual, there is no me. The smallest unit is whānau, which is your small collective. It's not biological family, it's like, the people that you choose around you, your little crew, your little unit, it could be your biological family, it could just be the people in the street or your work colleagues, whatever. So that's their small unit. You know, that's the smallest. So there is no me there. I'm not broken. I can't be diagnosed because actually I'm part of a collective. So that means there's something within our little collective that's not working. It's not that it's me. And so that entirely shifts the way that we look for solutions because we're not looking at an individualistic solution. We're not looking at plucking a person out of their whānau unit and putting them in a hospital. We're actually looking at what do we do to, to build and grow and support that family unit to keep this, um, this little unit working well? Like what's, what's not working and what could we do to support it? And so, yeah, within the, the language, and, you know, most Indigenous cultures don't have clinical language within their... Um, their natural dialect because it's a European construct and it's a white European Western construct. And so when we are thinking about it through that lens, we're looking for particular things, solutions and problems instead of actually thinking, indigenous communities think relationally by nature, tend to be more, and I think even Scottish, you know, traditional communities were much more tribal, clan-based and communities and collectives and so, we then look at collective solutions that are much more within the community. So it shifts our whole way of thinking. And you can only really work with a community if you under, if you take the time to understand the language they use, the why, what does it mean for you? Because some things actually aren't translatable mm. and because it comes to an entire concept. Yeah, and I think there's that, I mean, I, th I think understanding the way that different cultures and communities think about relationships and collectiveness, like that that is also helpful for people to understand when they're thinking about peers. Cause even though we might be, you know, white, white Western and not have those words and concepts, like where we are a collective 
and we are trying to move out of this idea of individual deficit and into this idea of, of world experience and and whether that's in the way that we deliver training because what we're asking yeah. people to do is come together and learn something together or whether it's in the way that we think about peer support and each other like we are trying to step out of this individual and I've, I, I, more recently after having come out of the nhs and, and being in the community i'm kind of starting to figure out where one-to-one -one peer support came from because like it's always been a community based a community type experience and how much of that has been influenced by the system and how and the idea of like we are working one to one with an individual because we're trying to fix someone rather than we're trying to build a community that's you know like it's a bit around humans and i can see Fran's dying to get in there so i am but please tell me to shut up if i have to because no, no. i know that i'm going somewhere <laughs> with um so i don't know if it's a thing that people are aware of, but um, open dialogue in Finland when you were talking, Lisa, about that network and that unit. I did the open dialogue training, so they do sit quite um, similar, actually, IPS and open dialogue. brilliant. So the, the, um, the model that's getting kind of um, researched at the moment in the UK, they've added peer support into it as pod, so peer supported open dialogue, and I've done that training. Um, probably should have said that at the start actually so um i'm in this kind of dual role where i'm in the peer world but i'm also still in the peer world but i'm a practitioner and that's when you start getting really complex things going on however i think we've managed and i have to say that training just reflecting on that training it's it was the um it was the most transformative thing inside me that i've been on and um, it was a year long thing. We did four weekly residentials spread out across the year. I mean, you're saying about discomfort agreement. I think it, it, I think only um, peers could come up with that, if I'm honest, because you've been sat in training yourself and, you know, something's come up and you've just had, you know, and now we're like, no, actually, we're going to do something about this. Um, it's the same in recovery colleges, quite similarly, when you're going into a course in a recovery college, you'll have that, not that term, but, you know, what to do if you're not okay. Um, but during the pod training, you know, trainers cried, colleagues cried, it was just normal. And rather than saying, um, thinking about vulnerability, because I think that's kind of coming from a different thing, which is important, but it was more just about allowing emotion, because emotion is human. Um, and bringing and, and allowing for that um because it was really self-work if that's a term like rather than learning something and getting this information in it was about how do i feel that, it? a lot of it is yeah. that kind of like i think like we were talking about before around acknowledging that we are bringing something into the room and figuring out what we're bringing ourselves i think a lot of people talk about it as like self-awareness and I'm not sure how much it's awareness is just being able to be authentic about because sometimes we don't know what's going on do we? sometimes like the idea of awareness is that we know what's going on but sometimes we don't sometimes mm. part of the learning is figuring it out but being able to be authentic in a room yeah whether you're yeah. a trainer or whether you're a trainee whatever wherever you're sitting like it's really important to be able to learn to be able to start from the point of like actually there's something going on here and and once you step into that discomfort that's when that's when I find that the learning. And there was some, such such uncomfortable conversations when you've got people who've had, you know, sons who've been in in um, hospital for 20 plus years and, and then you've got the people, psychiatrists sitting in the audience and it's all very about facilitating voices mm -hmm. and about, um, you know, that there, there can be disagreeing voices, but we need to bring them out. And we can reflect on them and respond to them and that's how you learn but it was so tense sometimes <laughs> and i think and i think there's um so i'm just um, like there's there's some there was a question in the chat around things like how how to facilitate a group and how to and supervision and that kind of stuff and i feel like that's there's some real structures there depend that depending on what situation you're in whether you're in a, a statutory service or whether you're in kind of communities can be a lot more fluid but statutory services peer support really needs to be protected and there's a lot more to think about around how you're going to how you're going to do that but I think one of the things that's really um really important around peer stuff is give it to the peers give it to, to give it to people and they will 
they, they'll know um so particularly around like groups and stuff like that like you don't as if is it one of the one of the things about facilitating a peace support group is it's not yours it's the groups so there's an awful lot of like and that's kind of tra like training or facilitate and there might be a, a, a slightly different one, but that's kind of what we're doing it's not we're here to give it to you really like that's kind of like as as a group as a, of attendees like this we're going to learn about this together and it doesn't always mean that I'm going to lead like sometimes it's going to come from in the group um I'm just noticing the time because I'll keep saying I'm going to keep it to time and then I get really annoyed at myself when I see the clock turn to the hour <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna like I kind of feel like it's it's not the most opportune point to stop but I am gonna just bring us to a close on me which is the way that I like it as having the last word um I just want to say a big thank you to Tyne, Franz, Fran and uh, and Lisa for coming and sharing. And I think there's so much more we could go into. And one of the reasons why we've kind of tried to keep this to an hour is because I think we could all talk about it all day. Um, and I just want to kind of um, have this opportunity uh, to just let everybody know that we've got a couple more webinars next week. One is on access to justice which is already lining up to be quite an interesting conversation and I can see that one getting um getting into, into some of the real difficulties in not just the their criminal justice systems but other elements of justice so we're hoping to have someone come waiting to confirm a speaker from um human trafficking and modern slavery youth led organization to talk about what happens when you fit in the gaps and there isn't a legal system that you can access then what happens as well as the lived experience workers thinking about employment um, and also around some of the other systems and some of the ways that we can be impacted around justice for an hour so that should be quite interesting <laughs> trying to get all of that in um, and then on, on Thursday next week we're going to be talking about subjective analysis and experiential research and what um what what we can bring if um if we use an experiential lens to analyze information, data, stories, whatever. Um, so that's that's next Thursday. But yeah, so a big thank you, uh, Tyne, uh, Fran and Lisa. Thank you guys for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. I always love these kinds of conversations. Um, if I could do this all day, I would. Um, so yeah, and have a good rest of the day and a great weekend. And um, hopefully we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.